So my name is uh, Přemysl Šucha. Uh, Zdeněk Hanzálek is on holiday and he asked me to introduce uh, the speaker. Uh, the last uh, seminar was about healthcare scheduling. It was an excellent talk. So today we will move to a different domain. It will be education. So it's my pleasure to introduce Andrea Scherf. He received his PhD from the University of Rome in 1994. During his study, he spent it one year at Stanford University. After graduating, he spent it one year at CWI in Amsterdam. And currently he's a full professor at the University of Udine and he's the head of the School of Management Engineering uh, at the same university. Andrea's main research interests are scheduling, timetabling, local search algorithms, and metaheuristics for combinatorial problems. And he's also very active in competitions and challenges addressing timetabling. So Andrea, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So thank Premis. Thank also to Zenek, uh, who is luckily in, uh, on vacation, but uh, is uh, very kind to invite me. So thanks a lot to him as well. Okay, so let's see if I can. Can you see my slides? Okay. So uh, this talk will be on educational timetabling. So I will try to cover various issues on this uh, uh, family of problems. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. So. I will start talking about problems and the benchmarks. Then I will talk about algorithms. In particular, we'll talk about our algorithm. So the algorithm developed by my group, which is in the local search paradigm. Then I'll show you some experimental results of these algorithms. Then I will, uh, uh, let's say, shortly talk also about some practical issues of timetabling because timetabling is a real challenge. So I have been doing timetabling for my university for 10 years. So I know also, I mean, what's the, the psychological part, let's say, of doing timetabling and interacting with uh, the, the users of the system. And then I conclude with some short discussion. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of history. I would say maybe the pre prehistory of timetabling. So timetabling started in, in the 60s, so the, with the work with Gottlieb, uh, Xima, uh, the Verra was very active at that time. So most of the problem mainly on the, what we will call later uh, high school timetabling. But I would say this is the beginning of uh, the research on timetabling. Then it came also the proof of NP, NP completeness that always happens. So uh, it turned out that everything slightly above the, the very, very basic formulation is NP complete. So this was proven by Evan and Shamir in 76. Uh, and then we had some uh, surveys already. Uh, so the earliest one is the one by Schmidt and Strollen that uh, already in the 80s uh, created, uh, in, an, in the 80, uh, an annotated by Glogger with 200 uh, papers. And then there are some historical surveys, one by De Verra, okay, I include also my own just to show that uh, I am an expert, uh, presumed expert in the field. So this is also my own uh, survey by, from 20 years ago. Okay, well, what's going on now in timetabling? Just a little bit of um, uh, current activities. So there is a, a series of conferences, so, which was established in 1995. So uh, I was there, it was very nice. And so, so we had the long uh, history of, uh, of, uh, um, of um, uh, conferences. So PATAT stands for Practice and Theory of Automated Timetabling. So the, the 13th edition will be in Bruges in, 2022, so uh, Bruges is a very nice city, so let me do a little bit of advertising for this conference, uh, which is uh, always very nice. Okay, so uh, uh, the current things are also a lot of timetabling competition, I will speak about the, the subject of these competitions because they were very important to foster the, the research in timetabling. So the first one was in, in 2002, and the latest one uh, just uh, finished a few days ago in uh, 2021. Okay, so and there is a working group which is called PATAT, like the conference, and uh, it's a Euro working group. Uh, so this is the link if you want to join, uh, see what's going on, and so. Okay, so let's get into the uh, the, the main part. So uh, what is educational timetabling? So the let's say if you want to say it in a national, is this set? So it's the problem of assigning teacher-student meetings to time slots and, and rooms. 
Okay, so there are various versions. So the main ones are the high school timetabling, the university course timetabling, the university examination timetabling. These problems are slightly different. So maybe from a certain level of abstraction, they can seem the same problem, but they are definitely not. So we working in optimization know that some details can change it here. There are more than details. So high school timetabling, it's more uh, the problem of having co compact uh, timetable for the students. So you, can let, you cannot let them uh, uh, alone. Uh, university courses, there are these various lectures of the course and examination are single uh, uh, events, which are uh, the exams. So these are the main problems studied in the community. There are others, uh, uh, events, conference, timetable, and these are also similar to examination timetable, but the, main, the, the single events don't have the same constraints of examinations like spreading and so on. Then you have student section when you want to divide the students in uh, for lab sessions or, or recitation or similar uh, activities. And then there are also others. Uh, here I just mentioned the balanced academic curriculum when you want to create the curriculum or, or the curricula uh, so that they are balanced in the years and the semesters and so on. Obviously the word timetabling has been used also outside educational timetabling. So there are others. So this, this slide is about what I'm not going to talk about. Okay. So employee timetabling also known as uh, in, the, in the book by Mike known as uh, workforce scheduling, so uh, train timetabling, uh, sport timetabling, and so on. So this, this is not our, uh, our subject. Okay, so let's go to the uh, motivations for, uh, um, for this uh, seminar, for this activity. Uh, as I said, I was in the early days of uh, timetabling and the typical uh, paper in the early days uh, where something like uh, a, a paper in which uh, the authors define a brand new problem, so they define their own problem. They apply their favorite technique, uh, so meta needing, taboo search, uh, genetic algorithms, integer programming, constraint program, whatever, uh, column generation, whatever it is. And then they compare it what, with what I call the straw man. So they compare it with the manual solution, but the manual solution, I mean, normally doesn't follow the same route. So, I mean, beating the manual solution, in some sense, it's easy uh, in some regard. And the, the most annoying part of this type of papers was the comparison with naive implementation of the alternative technique. So you create the designated loser and you say, you see, so you spend all your effort in your technique, then you spend half an hour in another technique and you see my technique is better than the other one. So this obviously is not the way to proceed. So we really need some common ground to, um, so we, we, at that time we realized that people were the first patat conference, we realized we really need the, the, the common ground for a comparison. This is in standard formulations and standard um, um, and benchmarks and so on. Okay, so what, what do we need? As I already said, standard formulation here, obviously this, there are some issues. So do we want the formulation being very general? We want it to be specific. Do we want to be simplified? Do we want to be strictly realistic and so on? Then obviously we need benchmark instances like a repository, languages, format for the files and so on. And obviously we also need, there is an issue of reproducibility. Uh, in, the, in the years we have been, uh, quite a few of false uh, results because uh, people simply work on corrupted files. So, uh, and then when you, when you see we're in front of someone claiming that a certain instance can be solved with uh, uh, the score 25 and you don't reach it, you get depressed, but then you realize that the score was buggy, okay? Not, not that people cheat, just simply they corrupted the file and, and so on. So this really happened, so we really need to, to work on this. Okay, and obviously also need statistical tests for comparison because I mean, we cannot just compare in the, like in the good old days on the average and so. Okay, so what, what was done in, in these uh, 25 years? Uh, let's start with high school timetabling. I see Gerard here, so maybe he wants to add something. So the standard formulation was, uh, uh, in, let, I put standard in, uh, in quotes because obviously I mean, it's not uh, standard in the, in the strict sense, but. Uh, was done by uh, researchers in the Netherlands, as I said, uh, Gerard here in Australia and many other countries. I also contributed a little, little, little bit. So I'm in the last one in Italy, which is this, this Italy is me, but it's, uh, these countries are in, in order of uh, contribution. So I'm the last one. 
And what they decided to do, and what we decided to do, but really it was not uh, was in, people in charge decided to do, is to make no very, very general. So they wanted to uh, uh, have a, a format that uh, um, really covers every possible high school uh, versions in the world. So the motto was no concession to judicious simplifications. So uh, obviously the result is that uh, the, the problem is very difficult. It's difficult, not that everybody can write a solver in a, in a few days and so on. Uh, the format at that time was the XML because I mean XML at least at that time was extremely uh, well known and extremely useful. And uh, now there are uh, more than 40 instances available. So uh, with a lot of results. So if you go to this uh, repository, uh, you see um, all the instances, results and so on and uh, solutions and so on. Okay, this is, is about high school timetabling. Let's go to examination timetabling. For examination timetabling, uh, the story started before because the, there was a very uh, nice formulation, very simple, I would say. It's slightly more complex than uh, graph calling. So this is on the other side, so it's uh, simplified. So this is very simplified. Uh, by, by uh, Mike Carter was uh, giving a talk two weeks ago. Um, so he proposed this, uh, 13 real world benchmarks, uh, some very big. And actually this, after 25 years, this benchmark has still not solved to optimality. So still there are, there is still a work on these benchmarks. And uh, some people, given that they're extremely simplified problem, try to extend it by adding some random data. So inventing the corollary data for this problem, for these instances. Uh, then we had the new formulation that uh, proposed by Barry McCallum and others. Uh, this was more complex, more uh, realistic, with a lot of difference, like uh, different sides of the slot. So I, I will talk about some of the uh, formulations later on. No, not this one, but some of them. And then we have many others. So like the one by uh, Thomas Mueller. Here I mentioned the one by my group. So but two things in my group. We have an uh, examination timetabling uh, formulation uh, in Italy which is slightly different but, uh, from the, the others because we have uh, every county has its own rules and so on, rules and fixations, I would say. Okay, for the uh, course timetabling, uh, there were two main uh, formulations, one which was uh, called post-enrollment uh, course timetabling, so the acronym is PCTT. Uh, the instances, unfortunately, this problem are all artificial, uh, and then we had what's called curriculum-based course timetabling. The difference is that in one case, the, um, um, the conflicts are given on the enrollment of students. In the other one, it's, it's are given by the published curricula. So not, not that you know exactly what the student do, but you know what is written in the manifesto of the university. And there are many other differences. And this is the, I would say, our problem. So uh, Luca Di Gasso and myself, we, we propose this problem. We have real world instances, 50 real world instances. Um, and this is also challenging and still studied, and there are still people working on these instances. Uh, actually, there is also a high quality generator. So if you want to test your, uh, do the tuning on uh, artificial instance and then use the real instance for, uh, for uh, validation, this is, the, this is possible. Okay, there are many others. So for example, another one by Mueller, Rudolf and others, uh, which is uh, very rich. So this again, it's with no simplification, structure, structure in the sense that there are more problems together and this problem there are, there is course timetable and student section together and totally real world. So totally based on uh, real data. Okay, and then I put these dots to say that there are many others. Okay, then let me talk a little bit about the competitions because uh, competitions really were important in our community. So I, I really think that uh, we should say uh, something about that. So the first one was in 2002. The problem was the post enrollment course and tabling. There were, there were five months to write the solver, 20 instances, 10 given the beginning, 10 given at the end, as artificial, as I said. There was a timeout. Timeout was based on uh, running a benchmark code and say, okay, on your benchmark, your uh, CPU has this power, so we have this time. So about uh, roughly 10 minutes. And the final place list was based on the average scores of the soft uh, constraints. Uh, the one in 2007 uh, was more elaborate because there were three tracks, examination and tabling, post enrollment course and tabling uh, revised, and uh, curriculum based course and So, this power more realistic, some real world data was used. 
And there was a, a third set of instances, which was the hidden instance. So this was never shown by to the participant. This uh, was they were used to validate at the end. So the, the, the solver of the best uh, participants were rerun by the organizer. So I was on, among the organizers. We, we, we did all the work to, to rerun it. And this was extremely important, I would say, because this was to prevent the, what's, what we call the Mongolian order approach. So in which you basically, you have a, a stochastic solver, you just keep trying and then you, um, you keep the best uh, solution, okay? So also known as a random seed optimization, okay? But it's optimization in a sarcastic way, okay? A sarcastic meaning. So you simply run a thousand uh, times and you, and you uh, provide a solution, the best of, of this one. Okay, and this was prevented because obviously uh, the software were rerun by the organizers. So it was a lot of work, but it was really worth doing it. And, and another novelty, which I think it's important for competition, is that adjudication was based on ranks, not based on uh, scores. Because uh, if you based on rank, if you have, a, for example, one very bad result on one instance, this doesn't compromise. Because for that instance, you may result last, but this gives you zero, doesn't give you a strong uh, penalization. OK, then we move on for other competitions. So the one in, in 2011 was on high school timetabling. Um, with on the format that I explained before, the rules were quite similar, but there was also a separate competition of best course because the idea was also that we wanted to see how, uh, wanted to find some best known results. So it was uh, nice to, to also ask to go for best known, but with as long as you want, you, you could run it for as long as you wanted because it was just to check how, how, how far you can go independently of the running time. Then there was another one in 2019, and this changed the, uh, the idea, which was on a more complex problem, as I said before, the one by Mueller and others, and the adjudication was only on best course. So no timeout, no showing code, you can use whatever you want, you can use whatever you have in your, uh, on your computer, you can use uh, uh, commercial software and so on, you just have to provide the best course. So this doesn't prevent the Mongolian order approach, but still uh, it turned out that, that the best ones won. So it's not that people cheat on this, uh, in this case. Okay, the last competition, I just mentioned it because it was on sport and it was not, so it was on the topic outside this uh, uh, educational timetabling subject. Okay, and the rules were the same. Um, okay, so let's move on the algorithms. As I said, that will be, this uh, will be very parochial. I don't know if this word, uh, Work so I will talk about my algorithms, okay? Because I mean, there is no time to speak all the approaches, so it's not a survey in this sense, okay? And the, uh, so we work on the local search paradigm, okay? I, I, I assume that everybody uh, here knows what local search, but let me remind it a little bit just to, uh, to to fix some terminology. So we have a search space. This uh, uh, this this is shown here. So we find in some way an initial state. And then we uh, start analyzing the neighbor. Analyze doesn't mean to, analyze, to enumerate all neighbors. Analyze can, be, can mean various things. Can mean just draw a random uh, neighbor, just analyze the full neighborhood, analyze a share of the neighborhood, analyze those which are not taboo, whatever that means, okay? So, um, so there's this, part, this move selection. And then the move they selected must be also be acceptable. So there is another test. If the move is acceptable, this becomes the new state. And so the move is applied. So the state is changed and we go on, okay? So if the stop there is not met, we keep going. So we select the move again. And if the move is acceptable, this is a new state and so on. And the stop criterion can be made. There are many stop criteria. Uh, can be time, can be iteration, stagnation detection quality reached, uh, all these things, okay? Stagnation detection, I mean, if you don't improve for a certain number of iterations, you stop, okay? And maybe do a multi restart. Okay, so I'm inside the local search paradigm, uh, what we use mostly was simulated annealing. So simulated annealing is the oldest of the local search methods, uh, but still very, uh, effective, so we decided to go on with simulated annealing for many uh, timetabling problems. And uh, this is the pseudocode of simulated annealing. So the idea is really that the initial state is random. So you record the, 
uh, initial state. So the best the initial state is the best state. And then there is this notion of temperature. So uh, we you start with a high temperature, which is the T with zero, T sub zero, which is the initial temperature. And while the temperature is higher than the final temperature, so F is the final, stands for final. What we do, we do a certain number of iterations of each temperature. So NS is the number of samples of each iteration. While this sample is less than the, the, the max, we draw a random move. So a random neighbor in the, uh, in the search space. Now we compute the delta. Obviously, uh, computing the delta efficiently is the key of any local search procedure. So you don't really do. So this is just uh, for pseudocode, but you don't really compute the initial cost and the new cost. You try to compute efficiently the difference of cost, and this is important. If delta is less than zero, which means it's uh, an improving move because we implicitly assume we are talking about minimization problems, we do the move, and if this is better than the best, we update the best. If the move is worsening, so it means we also accept worsening moves because we want to escape from local minima in the, in the space. Um, we draw a random uh, value between zero and one. And if this is less than e to the minus delta f to t, this means, OK, you don't have to understand fully this uh, formula, which is called the metropolis formula. The idea is that the higher is the, um, is the delta, the, the less you are going to accept the move. And the higher is the temperature, the more you're going to accept the move. It means at the beginning, the temperature is very high. Everything is chaotic. We accept a lot of uh, non-improving moves, a lot of worsening moves. Uh, as the as the temperature goes down, uh, you accept all improving moves. So this uh, the metaphor is this of uh, annealing uh, metals in which at the beginning they move chaotically, slowly uh, reducing the temperature slowly, they get to the very stable uh, state. Okay, so at, after each temperature, we decrease the temperature. With this, uh, this is called the geometric uh, uh, cooling. So T becomes T multiplied by alpha, where alpha is less than one. It's normally 0 0.9, 0 0.95 or so. Okay, this is the very basic simultaneous. This is the classical simultaneous. Uh, in our uh, uh, solutions, we did a, a small uh, improvement. Uh, which use the so-called cutoff mechanism. So you uh, decrease the temperature even before then reaching the number of samples if you reach the number of accepted moves. So this red one means you have a number of accepted moves. So there are two criteria for exiting. Either you reach the number of samples or you reach the number of accepted moves. And if you accept the move either because it's improving or uh, sideways or because you accept it because it's, uh, uh, you decide to accept it probabilistically, then you uh, increase this NA. So the idea is that at the beginning, if you, uh, if at certain time you've done enough movement, you can start uh, decreasing the temperature. Okay, I'm sorry, I cannot go uh, in more details because I don't have time. This is not a talk on sweet annealing, but if you have questions, please stop me and I will um, answer. I will be happy to answer. Okay, so now let's see how we apply simultaneous annealing to some of these problems. I will discuss uh, more in details on our problem, which is the uh, curriculum-based course sign tabling, because I see this as, a, uh, as I said, this problem that we define, we provide instances, so really I like this problem, so there's some affection for this problem. Okay. So this problem is a bit simplified with respect to reality. So the basic entities is uh, there are courses and lectures. So for example, database is the course that has been given three times a week. So the basic is the uh, it's the week. So we repeat the same. Uh, so we have to do the weekly schedule, not not the, not for the full academic year because we assume that it's repeated identical. Then we have periods and days. So the first period is a Monday from 8.30 to 10.30. And let's say here there are five periods per day uh, and uh, five days, so 25 uh, periods. Okay, and then we have the rooms so with the seats and so with number of seats. And then we have the curricula. So curricula means that we have, for example, civil engineering second year, I have these courses, math two, structural engineering and so on. And the curricula determine the conflicts, but also the, um, also the, the objectives, the soft conflicts, for mechanical engineering third year and so on. Okay, no uh, enrollment because we don't compute the enrollment when we do the timetable. The timetable is done before the enrollment. So it's blind in this, in this sense. So the students, uh, uh, we, we uh, satisfy students that follow the curricula. Students that make strange choices are uh, on their own. 
Okay, so which are the, uh, the constraints and uh, objectives that we call R constraints and soft constraints? So conflicts, obviously, two courses of the same, the same curriculum cannot be given at the same time. Uh, two rooms can be, cannot be occupied by the, in the same time. Uh, teacher can declare that they're not available in certain days. So if they're not available, they, they cannot be scheduled. Uh, the room capacity. The room capacity is soft. Um, this sometimes looks strange, but obviously the number of students is just uh, an estimation. So uh, if you have a room of uh, 100 uh, seats and you have a, a phase number of students, which is 101, this is perfectly fine because they never show up all the, at the same time. So uh, you just pay one, let's say one, one, one point in the, in the objective function. Uh, there is a minimum number of working days for teachers, so we don't want teachers to teach all the lectures in the same day. There is an issue of uh, compactness, so uh, we don't want students to come for one lecture, then do nothing and come for another lecture later on. And then there is this notion of room stability. We want courses to be given in the same, um, always in the same room, because teachers get used to the room, students get used to the room. This is not the real problem. This is, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we, uh, we, there is no concession to judicial simplification. It's the opposite. Simplification ago go. So, and I would say not necessarily judicious in the sense that we didn't think of all the possible implications of this simplification. It was just to create a standard problem. Okay. For example, some of this. Uh, for example, room stability is not so important. So there are things that we left outside that are more important, but we wanted to have something related to rooms. We wanted to have some. Uh, constraint, which was a constraint or objective, was a witness of the constraints on the rooms. So in this room stability turned out to be a good choice. Okay, so how how you uh, tackle this problem by uh, local search? So uh, the search space that we use is uh, um, a matrix, a matrix with courses on the uh, on the rows and um, um, periods in the column, and the value is the uh, room. Okay, so this was the idea. Okay, here obviously there is no, in the real matrix, there's not the name, there is an index, of course. And um, um, obviously there might be conflicts. For example, if C1 and C3 are courses uh, in the same curriculum, here there's a conflict. Here there is another conflict, uh, the room occupation conflict, because here room one is used twice. So these are possible. So you, you cannot. Uh, 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 or remove every possible conflict from the search space. Otherwise, the problem is to find the initial solution, of course. Uh, whereas we decide to keep the teacher's availability variations outside. So there is no reason to put a lecture here where there is this cross means the teacher is not available and then move it away. Whereas there is the idea of having conflicts and room occupation violations makes more sense because then you can put something that creates a violation but remove something else that, to remove the violation. Okay, so this is a search space. The enables that we use is the move one lecture from a new period in a new room. So this is the standard, I would say standard enablement for this problem. The other one, it's also uh, pretty standard, which is swap lectures, so swap period the room of two lectures. So we use these two neighbors in the union uh, and we use with annealing, as I said before. So, okay, here, I'm sorry, I'm repeating this with annealing, but just to uh, mention the uh, parameters. So this problem has a lot of parameters. Uh, this solution technique for this problem has a lot of parameters. Initial and final temperature, cooling rate, move sample each temperature, accepted move for each temperature. The ratio of the two, um, of the two uh, neighborhoods, because we don't want to, when we say we draw a random move, we first draw uh, we decide whether to draw move lectures or swap lectures. Uh, and we don't want to do it arbitrarily. This is a parameter. So if we say uh, this is optimized, a parameter which is uh, tuned like the others, and uh, maybe the final uh, uh, the optimization of the configurations that uh, we have to do 70% swaps and 30% uh, move lectures, for example. Okay. So the important idea is that you, we don't want to make any a premature commitment. So we want to put everything in parameters and let the parameter tuning decide what to do. Um, okay, so uh, the results for this problem, then I would say also results for the other problems, adding a few things on the, how we tackle them. So the first the thing I want to talk about is the parameter tuning, because uh, I really think that statistical principle, the uh, parameter tuning, it's extremely important. So first of all, we wanted to compare the various uh, 
um, configurations uh, using the same time. And the trick to do that is to fix the number of iterations. So the, one of the parameters is computed from the others. So there's a simple formula with logarithmics that, so not all parameters are left uh, uh, free. There are some parameters. The last one is computed from the others to have the fixed number of iterations. So that, uh, because otherwise you, you cannot compare two different initial solutions if one takes more time, one takes less time. Then we have these parameters, so T0, Tf, the sigma, the ratio between an A and an S, uh, as I say, ratio between uh, move lectures and move lectures, and then the results of this WH, which is the weight of the art violations. This is also another key point that uh, when you have art violations, you want to uh, weight them more than the soft ones, but not too much, because otherwise you don't make uh, worse any moves, because uh, it's made an sensible to the delta. So you don't want to give an arbitrary high value. You want to give a, a value which is high enough, okay? Uh, so uh, given all these parameters, we have to make a design of experiments, so do D O E design experiment, and we use the Amersley point set. So uh, the Amers point set, it's a, it's a set of space filling uh, points that I'll show you here in a, an example, so on the top part, you have the full factorial. So for example, you have uh, three parameters, 10 points. So if you do the full factorial, you have one 10 times 10 times 10, 1,000 parameters. And this is the projection in the three, uh, in the three, um, in the, in the three phases. Here, these are the Amersley points set. You see, if you look at the projections, they are space filling as much as the full factorial, but these are 100 points. These are 1,000 points. Okay, so the idea is that you want to reduce the number of points. So you, and the way it's to do some, uh, some high, some, some low to combine all of them, okay? It's similar for those who, who know this uh, area, they're similar to the uh, Latin squares or Latin hypercubes, if you want to generalize. But the Amersley point set, it's much more flexible. So you, you can say, okay, I have five parameters, 25 points, and it generates the, all the points. So it's a really useful uh, uh, technique for design of experiments. And you see, it's, uh, it's an old one, but no, not so known. At least this is my view, but it's extremely useful. I don't know why it's called Amersley point set. I don't know why Einscom uh, has been neglected, but uh, for some reason, that's the historical name. Okay, for comparing the, the, the configuration, we use the f race procedure. The one pro proposed by Biratari means that you basically start with all the configurations. Uh, uh, as soon as you have enough uh, runs, you start eliminating those which are inferior, okay? So you don't go on with all the, all the one, uh, let's say, 100 points. As soon as they are inferior, you are statistically proved that they are inferior, you st uh, stop them and continue only with the best one. It's a race. At a certain point, only one remains, okay? So the others are dying the, in the process, and when you remain with one or you have expired your time, these are, uh, these are all, if you expire before you, you end up with one, uh, obviously uh, you can say these are uh, identical. Uh, uh, you, you cannot uh, uh, ref uh, confu refute the uh, null hypothesis. Okay, so uh, the f race inside uses this uh, Friedman rank test and the Wilcoxon test. For those who know a little bit of statistics in different uh, situations, they use these different tests. And so. Okay, we use uh, this, uh, um, this software, which is called JSON 200, does all this thing. Uh, so it creates the Amersley point, uh, runs a phrase, runs the code. It's a very nice software tool that uh, uh, does all this uh, uh, and divides in various uh, threads of the computer. So usually, mainly for me, it's a, it's a black box. Um, if you're not an expert of, uh, of statistics. Okay, what are the results? Uh, these are the results on the uh, curriculum based course time tabling. Uh, obviously, uh, these are the results at the time we did it. So we have been working on various problems in time. So this, uh, let's say now there are probably better results. So, but at that time when we did it, we were the best. You can see from the blue here. Okay, so these are the results on the uh, 21 instances. These are the best known found with other techniques, much longer time. So this, all these are with fixed time, the time of the competition. So let's say 10 minutes. Some people have better results with much longer time, but longer time, it's, I mean, time is important. Uh, you cannot uh, compare two results with different times. Okay, I'm sure there are better results now. Uh, 
Okay, we applied the same idea, exactly the same technique, but with some changes because problems are slightly different. For example, to the post enrollment for some tabling. For example, in this case, the room assignment does not contribute to objective function. Any feasible room, it's okay. There is no penalty for any different room. So this uh, uh, made uh, available a lot of pre-processing. For example, there are some events can, that can go in any room. This You don't just don't give them rooms because you, you, can, you, you can do it, uh, eventually in the post-processing to give them room. So in the pre-processing, you define, identify these events. In the post-processing, you assign them rooms. Then uh, the neighbors are uh, basically uh, uh, the same, except that you don't uh, use the room. So you don't, you don't assign the room. The room is not in the neighborhood. It's deterministically assigned to the room, which is the least attractive. So the one which is less wanted by other, uh, by other uh, events. I'm going a little bit fast. So probably not catching everything, but I understand it. Just to give you the idea that uh, there were other ideas uh, that to specialize to this specific uh, post enrollment formulation. And some people for this problem use some sort of matching. So first you assign the period, then you do the matching. In our case, we, we decided to do no matching, just this idea of putting everything in the least attractive room was enough to have very good results. And the results at that time were very good. These are, I mean, again, a little bit older results, but at that time they're very good. Uh, now I know there are better results. Uh, I didn't have that, sorry, I didn't have that time to put all of them in the, in the, um, in the, uh, in these tables, because I mean, a lot of people work on these problems later on. So there's, uh, I mean, a lot of work to, to find these results. Um, Okay, uh, we also work on Carter's problem, the one that, uh, by Mike uh, was here two weeks ago. This is a simple, simpler problem. We work on this problem later, actually. And uh, indeed, for this problem, there were a lot of very, very good results. So we had to do a lot of work to improve it. And so we had to use much larger neighborhoods. So Kempe chain, multi swaps, you in, using three, swapping three nodes. Uh, mo most of these neighborhoods are, come from the uh, graph uh, coloring uh, community. So they, in graph coloring, they really have a lot of uh, uh, ideas. So we really uh, use, uh, we really borrow these ideas for uh, uh, examination timetabling. And so we use this sort of neighborhood portfolio approach in which you really have to decide uh, how much of each uh, neighborhood you use. And some neighborhoods are extremely expensive to um, to compute, so you have to use them carefully. So you have to take into account also how, how expensive they are to they are to compute uh, um, a neighbor. So we really have to do a lot, uh, we did a lot of work, uh, and again there is a lot of parameters because all the neighbors are internal parameters, the maximum length of the chain, maximum length of the multi swap. So it's really uh, the lot uh, there were a lot of choices. So here also the Parameter tuning was multi-stage, but the results were extremely good. And these are best contribution up to today because this, this is a work we did uh, very recently. The solutions are available. We have a, a website in which you publish all the uh, instances and solutions. So for reproducibility, all these solutions are available. So the code is available. And here, uh, many people work on this problem and uh, some early work, I mean, and we improve on most of the instances. So. I'm really happy with this result. This is a, a very recent paper uh, on uh, computer and operations research. Um, okay, so we also work on the examination timetable. Here, the results are not so good, so I'll skip them. Okay, here, there's this work by uh, by Bikoff, by Yuri Bikoff and Sanya Petrovic that were better than ours. So, uh, and also, we didn't find all feasible solutions. This percent of feasible, in some cases, we couldn't find a feasible solution, but just to show not only the success, uh, um, the success uh, results, but also some, let's say, medium results. Um, okay, so uh, some comments. Uh, my main comment is that we use this uh, simultaneity, which is, let's say, it's uh, old-fashioned technique. Okay, simultaneity, it's, uh, it's the mother of all the local search technique, all the meta heuristic was. Uh, was uh, invented in 83. So some people say, no, you should do something newer. But actually there is this, this very nice work by Franzin and Stutzling, which they revitalize simultaneously. They really study all the very variants of the combination of simultaneously. And, uh, uh, and they show that it's, it's, uh, it's alive and kicking, okay? And I totally agree on that. So, uh, I mean, uh, and actually there's also this another very nice work by uh, Sorensen in which they, 
um, in which they, they talk about the, this paper is called the metaphor exposed, in which say all these novelty, new meta heuristics, new animals, new metaphors are really crap. That's what he says. That uh, you really have to think about the the the, the first principles of a of local search, for example, or genetic algorithms. Or other. So it's not inventing a new metaphor or a new uh, idea. Uh, it's uh, it's meaningful. It's more meaningful to study all the variants of the uh, of the initial uh, techniques like Sweet. And it is what Franzin and Stutzle did. So they studied all the variants of the various components of simulated annealing or various uh, different acceptance criteria, different uh, cooling rate. And they found out, and I would say they found out that the, the initial idea of, uh, from uh, 1983 was is still good, it's still uh, competitive with uh, new ideas. Okay, so some other lessons. So complex neighborhoods are, are needed. So you cannot just uh, do swap. Uh, you really, if you want now to be competitive, you have to invent uh, complex neighborhood and process them very efficiently. So there's a lot of uh, manual work. So you spend a lot of time in programming because uh, you have to really to write your code in the best way to save time during um, computational delta costs. Um, also, another lecture is that the systematic, comprehensive, and statistically principled tuning is absolutely crucial. So you cannot just say, okay, I, I really annoy when I see the papers which, okay, we fixed a uh, number of uh, uh, elements in the population 20. You say, no, no way. Explain me how you got to this 20, okay? So I, I think this is extremely important. And now it's very cheap because there are, there are a lot of tools. For example, uh, uh, SMAC is another tool. I, I'm using a phrase, but there are others in which they, you can use them as black box. So I'm not an expert in statistics at all. I use them as black boxes uh, or I team with uh, experts in statistics. So that's the other. The other trick, okay, to team with uh, experience as I did in some as, as we did in some papers. Okay, so this, this I would say it, this is it for the uh, experimental results. Now I would go. Um, I will spend the last uh, few minutes on practical issues. As I said, I have been doing the real time tabling for my um, university for ten years. So uh, for ten years I have been the person uh, designing the algorithms, the person writing the code, the, the person responsible for the timetable, and the secretary doing the manual insertions of the data. So I really have uh, some experience. So let's go now on a completely different uh, topic. So first of all, um, the problem is much more complicated than what I discuss here. So the curriculum-based course timetabling is a, a nice simplification, but it's a simplification. So the real problem is much more and more complex. So there are, I would say 20, 25 different cost components. So uh, for example, uh, the student workload, it's not taken into account. Uh, sometimes we want double lectures, so two lectures one after the other because we want to do lab and so on. The, uh, the suitability of the room, because sometimes it's not only a matter of capacity, but it's a matter of projector, air conditioning. So there are a lot of things. Pre-assignments, you have a lot of people say, oh, I want to do on Monday. No way, you can't move me. 20 years till I do it on Monday. Uh, some lectures go to external rooms for some reason. Uh, some, there are the commuters. So it's not that they want, commuters, it's not that they want Monday and Friday free. That's easy. They want three days in a row uh, that can be Monday, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday or uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's more, much more difficult, okay? So what, what I, I mean, you can simplify it and say, okay, Monday, you, you can translate in the Monday and Friday free, but that obviously you lose uh, solutions. So that is the issue of lunch break. We completely ignoring this problem. Uh, max number of day lecture for teachers because we have a maximum number of daily lecture for the course, not for the teacher. If the teacher is teaching two, three, four courses, then obviously there is also this issue. There is some courses should, should at some point be simultaneous because sometimes they, they merge. There are a lot of things that you, uh, there is an issue of fairness. Uh, uh, Maurice Mullentara wrote the thesis on this uh, on this issue. Uh, so he has a very various uh, uh, various notions of uh, fairness, and it's very interesting. So because okay, you say the score is 100, but it cannot be 100 with 90 is paid by students of civil engineers in second year. So really, there is uh, this uh, issue and many others. So as I said, there are 25. Uh, uh, real uh, problem, real world uh, uh, cost types, and you have to take in account all of them, so you cannot skip that. 
Okay, for the examination titanium, also we define the Italian formulation, which is also well. I, I will skip it. Um, as again, we don't consider a student enrolling, we just do everything based on curricula. Uh, some exams go to multiple rooms. And also, there is uh, there are preferences because teachers count. In Italy, teachers can say what they want. I know in other places, they just they don't, more civilized countries, they don't care what the teachers want, they just um, uh, do what is best for students, but uh, we actually, we don't do that. Um, and then there is this, uh, this issue of having the oral and the written part uh, separate in different days with maximum distance and so on. Again, there are a lot of other issues that uh, the real problem has, uh, um, uh, has to take into account. Okay, so some considerations on this uh, practical work that I did uh, for the, in these years. So first of all, it's very difficult to keep the combinatorial, psychological, and political aspects apart. So really you have to be psychologist. So you have to convince your colleagues that it's not that they're hated by somebody, but it's just a chance. So really this is, this is the most part of the work is to discuss with people, uh, convince them, uh, reassure them, uh, uh, let them accept what happened, okay? Instead of uh, complaining. So this is the most part, not, 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 not writing this with any code. The most difficult part is this one, okay? And the higher you are in the position, the higher you are in the position, the better it is, because uh, if you are a full professor, it's much easier than if you have an assistant professor, but that's it's obvious. Okay. Another thing that I learned on my expenses is that post-publication changes are very time consuming. This is something, maybe it's clear, but if you, if you bump into it, you realize. So it's not, you should not, um, um, you should not just publish a draft because then after that you're doomed. So you really have to do everything in advance. So you really have to make uh, the, the best you can do in, in advance. So because why? Because the users, they don't feel the computer are complete. Okay, university professors don't understand and be complete. There's no way, okay? So the, this I can prove, I have proof on that. They don't understand the, the, the idea that you have an objective function. And so my recommendations, are, if you're going to uh, uh, do this job is, um, first of all, you have to convince teachers to specify the, the requirements in advance. So it's very important that they give you the requirements because otherwise if they don't, they don't give the requirement, they knock, they knock at your door and say, I want you to do this change. If they gave you the, the requirement in advance, you can always say, I'm sorry, I did my best, but I couldn't. I knew your request, I did my best and I couldn't. So, and the true essence of timetabling is in the face that you make when you say this, convince them, not, not in simulator kneeling. This is the true essence of, uh, of, uh, of doing the timetabling. So uh, how good you are in convincing people that they should, they should give up. Okay, obviously you have to limit the percentage as much as possible. Okay, take these advices also a little bit as a, as a fun, okay? But uh, in, some part, in some sense, uh, uh, they are true. Uh, why you want to link the assignment? Because the are very, are very, uh, are very constraining, right? So if you, a colleague comes to your office and say, oh, I'm very easy. I just want the, the, the schedule of last year. This is extremely constraining, okay? The schedule last year is exactly here, here, here. So you have to say, no, no way. Don't tell me you want the, 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 the schedule last year. Tell me, you tell me you want Friday free, you want Monday free, but don't tell me you want the schedule of last year because that's extremely constraining. Um, okay, obviously the interface is very important because you want to do manual changes and so on. So, um, I mean, it's important that you have the tools, not only the, optimization tools, uh, but also the, 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 the graphical tools to do all the changes and so on. Uh, and as I said before, they don't, they don't understand the objective function. The, the objective function is for you. Okay, the objective function is something between me and my, and my uh, code. It's not for uh, the, the use because they, they, you mess up if you, say, if you say, okay, this costs five, this costs four, say no, they don't agree. And so, so really have to, for your health, don't share the objective function. It's, 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 utop it's utopia to, to share the objective function and say, okay, we all agree in this objective function, the cost is 25, we all agree. No way, no, they will, have, they will have always complain about the objective function. So forget it, you just say, this is the best, uh, okay. You can also use the word optimal, even if it's, 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 it's a lie. I use the word optimal a lot, it's a lie because uh, obviously they don't know the objective function, they, they, they cannot, uh, uh, argue about optimality. 
Okay, so just a few, uh, I think I'm, I'm just in time. So just a few seconds for uh, the conclusions. So uh, future trends, well, I, I really don't know the future. One thing we, I did not discuss is that obviously this uh, pandemic will create new issues. So, I mean, uh, rooms cannot be used for full size. So probably they will be online and so on. So I think there will be new requirements. Uh, so this is something uh, can happen. Okay. Obviously we need standard timetabling languages in JSON, XML. We need parsers for this. Uh, we need generators of our instances because we want to use uh, random instances, which are good random instances. We need benchmark repositories, of course, uh, and solution checkers, because uh, as I said, the history explained us that this is extremely necessary. There are still some fake results that are around. You see them in papers. So uh, people say, why didn't you cite that paper? And then I have to say, I didn't cite because that result is not, uh, uh, it's not trustworthy because I don't want to cite keep the chain in which you cite the result, which is fake. It's not that people do it fake, just that people make some mistakes. So the, the, these results are still in, in circle, in, uh, are still in the, in the community. Uh, one thing I didn't speak about it, but uh, I think it's very important, is to do feature-based algorithm selection, okay? So in which you see the instance, you realize the, the features of the instance, and you select the algorithm or the configuration based on this instance. So there's this uh, nice features of the feature space in which you say, okay, this algorithm works in this part of the feature space, this algorithm works in the other part of the feature space. This is extremely interesting. There are a lot of nice work by mainly by Kate Smith Miles and others. So uh, I think it's an interesting future direction. And as I said, the post-publication tools, but this is, I mean, not, not, not for research, but really need to do also a little bit for research. Some people do work on uh, minimal perturbation optimization in which you want to optimize, but also keep it uh, uh, as, as similar as possible to the previous one. So there's uh, quite some work on this uh, as well. Okay, uh, and obviously the last one, I would like to see the commercial software with state-of-the-art optimizers inside because there is still a gap. So the commercial, not, not completely, maybe, maybe the gap is filling, but still commercial softwares uh, inside have some, some uh, uh, let's say, simplified ideas from the programmers, which are not uh, experts in optimization and the, uh, and the optimizers remain in the prototypes and so on. So this is still uh, going on. Okay, I think I'm, uh, I'm in time. So thank you for your attention. I'm uh, open to questions. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much. You. So um, we, can, we can open for for questions and for discussion yeah. so i i believe that we have quite uh, many teachers here so i expect <laughs> some some very mm -hmm. interesting and <laughs> involved questions so feel free to ask maybe you want to unmute everybody yes <laughs> yeah will i'm already unmute allowed you to uh, unmute so you can unmute yourself so first question please May, may I ask one question? Uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yes, we yes. can go ahead, and Alessandro. Okay, you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, hello. Hello, Andrea. It's nice to, very nice talk, very informative, even for people who are not exactly in timetabling like me. So uh, just out of curiosity, um, what, uh, I'm curious to know how actually, given your experience, how do you handle or and or how do you think is the best way of handling uh, uh, teacher's preferences, okay? Because, for example, in Siena, we say each person has the right to specify, uh, to specify five time slots in which you don't want to give lectures and another five time slots in which you prefer not to give lectures uh, across the whole week. And our time slots are one hour time slots. <laughs> But, you know, who knows, maybe there are some more effects. This, this system seems to work pretty well in terms of satisfaction, eh? but I would be curious to know about uh, your experience, given all the experience you have. Okay, can I answer? Okay, 
Uh, first of all, ciao, Sandro. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, uh, okay, now uh, our university is now is using a software, so commercial software, and the software acts exactly as you suggested. So basically, there are some free slots, some uh, uh, expensive slots. So exactly as you said, uh, the way the time I did it, I was much more flexible because uh, I mean there are some people who they would struggle. Uh, to, the, to death if they want something more than, than five uh, free slots. So I decided to be flexible because as I said, if you, if you can stay away from pre-assignments, if to some people you give them 10 free slots, I mean, doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, change your objective function. So I really thought that there are people like myself, I, I, I mean, I, I live in Udine and I have no reason to express more uh, preferences. So really, I did it in an extremely flexible way, and uh, this was okay. Obviously, when you move to to using a software uh, which is a commercial, software, then everything is regulated. But I don't have a, uh, I don't have a, uh, I don't have any special advice. I would just say that uh, the easiest way to me is to if you can to be flexible. Obviously. You don't don't tell the truth, the full truth to everybody. Otherwise, uh, say why well, you gave him uh, ten uh, options to give him five. So you start knowing people and you basically arrange. Uh, that's the the truth. So <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Next question, please. Hello? Well, uh, I have a question. If if no one else goes, um, yes, go ahead. Me well, or is my microphone bad? No, we can hear no, you. We can, okay, hear we you. can hear you well. Okay, perfect. So uh, I was wondering when. So you're writing your own uh, your own uh, programs, and you've been working on a lot of scheduling problems in the past. What's your impression on how the commercial solvers like Cplex or Jurobi is doing uh, compared to uh, writing your own programs in terms of performance on, on solving time and, uh, and um, a distance from optimality? Okay, this is a $1 million question because uh, uh, my, my solver is a, is a heuristic. So it's not, doesn't guarantee to find the optimal solution. Whereas you're talking about the uh, Cplex and Grobe are integer program based on integer programming, so they, in principle, find the optimal solution. Okay, uh, so uh, people in integer programming they really claim that uh, I mean the only real solvers are integer programming solvers. Uh, heuristics are just uh, for uh, are not real uh, science. Okay, I'm joking. Of course, that's not completely. Um, obviously, now when I do research, uh, I try always to first to to write the model in, in Cplex or Grobe. And if I think it's not rich, the, the instances are not reachable for Cplex or Groby, then I move to uh, meta heuristics. Okay, because uh, um, because uh, I mean, if the problem is easy, let's say, obviously I'm not an expert of uh, of integer programming, so my uh, my integer programs are extremely simplified, so are very let's say scholar, I do not say very naive, but still uh, it's checked to do. Obviously, I mean, in research, everybody does his job. So if somebody comes with a, a better solution using Cplex, so I mean, this is another reason why you want to have these uh, uh, benchmarks in which, uh, uh, which people can coming from uh, heuristics like me or coming from integer programming using can, uh, can work. And for example, in this, um, um, uh, in this curriculum based course contain most of the instances, not all of them are now solved to optimality by someone using a, a Cplex, um, but in much longer time. So maybe you don't have that time to wait. In other problems, it's not the case. So some of the problems are too, too big for, uh, for Cplex or uh, for integer programming. Obviously, people working on integer programming can also find some sort of heuristic to cooperate with the integer programming. So I, I, I mean, I, I cannot say more than that, but maybe somebody else can answer better than me because uh, I see there are other experts here. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, next question. 
There is a question on the chat box. Okay, uh, it's a question from Professor Sandeep Main. Um, so the question is, uh, there is still room for doing research. Um, well, uh, the fact that we, uh, can I answer? Okay, I'll try to answer direct. The fact that they, we have this benchmark, this uh, standard uh, formation, obviously as the fact that it's difficult to improve on that because there are a lot of people work on these instances. So it's really difficult to, to, to go better than them. But I think this is the challenge of the research. I think uh, it's interesting. So if you do, as I, as I said, in many papers you do, you invent your own problem, you solve it and you clap yourself. I think this is not the, the research that I like to do. So I would say, yes, there is still room because I mean, many problems are still unsolved. People are moving to more complex problems. So the formulation, for example, that I just mentioned by Mueller and others, which is extremely complex uh, uh, with um, um, clinical with uh, a student sectioning together with course time tables. So the, they are not solved uh, at all. So there's still room for new techniques. Uh, so we are absolutely welcome to, to join our community. If this was the question, I hope I answered the question correctly. There is another question on YouTube. How important is to get an optimal solution rather than a feasible uh, solution? Okay. From the, uh, as I said, from the practical point of view, optimal solutions are totally useless, I would say. Maybe I'm too extreme because they don't understand the, the, the objective function. So, I mean, the objective function is, is never fully that, okay? It's never fully there. So the objective function is totally questionable. So the fact that the solution is optimal means nothing, okay? So um, basically in the practical cases, finding the optimal solution, it's not mean nothing, okay? Because it's much more difficult to, to get to model and formalize the problem correctly. So not finding the optimal solution. Okay? In uh, research, obviously, if you can find the optimal solution where people don't find it, you are better and you publish and you get promoted and so on. So uh, that, that, that's my view. <laughs> I don't know if I'm too uh, clear cut, but uh, you know, I, I, that's what I would say. But maybe Mike and others can uh, comment on this. Other. Okay, so and next question, please. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is Salwani from Malaysia. Actually, I have two questions. The first one, just to get uh, an opinion from Andra Shah. Like say, for example, uh, we are doing research in solving, because we find out there are some papers uh, like uh, solving uh, cost time tabling, what we call it, so-called real cost time tabling by right. If we compare the difficulties, the complexities of the, uh, the complexity compared to the standard benchmark problems, it looks like uh, the standard benchmark problem is more complex compared to the what so-called real world problems. So in that case, um, is it advisable to the researchers to continue in solving a practical time time problem, problem even it is simpler than the standard benchmark problem? Okay, that is my first question. The second one is I'm trying to get the opinions regarding to the population-based metaheuristic, even the top tonight is on the simulated annealing. So if we look at that, at the current trend, there are too many population-based metaheuristics, which is based on nature-inspired algorithm. If we look at, at the literature, there are plenty, it's like soft swamp algorithms, firefly algorithm, and whatsoever, which is based on the genetic algorithms. So what is your opinions in new researchers try to uh, investigate a new metaheuristic which is fall under population base rather than try to investigate more on the basic uh, metaheuristic algorithm is like the normal local search simulated underlying the taboo search and whatsoever okay, thank you okay okay hello salvani nice to see you again and, yeah nice um, to see you thanks <laughs> Uh, first of all, the, the first question said uh, that sometimes the realistic problems are, are uh, easier than the benchmarks. 
Uh, actually, this is not my experience. So my experience is the opposite. So realistic problems are extremely different. Obviously, in some cases, realistic problems can real problems can be easy, but uh, the experience with people is that most of the time it's not. So I would say benchmarks are not easier in general. So, but I, uh, I mean, I cannot say more than that. So I think my experience that the idea is that uh, real problems are difficult, and you have normally you have to simplify them to make them to to be able to. To, to deal with them. Uh, if you found some uh, cases which are simpler, uh, um, well, it's interesting to see them, but uh, the, the, my experience is the opposite. So real problems are, uh, are complicated because there are a lot of details that make it more difficult. Uh, uh, so I, I cannot say more than that. Um, um, regarding the population base, whether, uh, okay, population base, it's better or, not to respect to local search this is really a matter of a, I mean, I would say it's everybody has its own preferences and I think uh, eventually the best ones emerge. So I am not saying I, I'm, I would say I like, uh, I stick to my, I stick to my weapons. Okay. That's the way. So I, I am not because uh, somebody has success with another weapon. I, I, I change my weapon. So, uh, it's difficult to say, I mean, this is part of research, okay? So what is better emerges over time. So if in 10 years, uh, everybody doing genetic algorithms uh, consistently are superior to those doing local search, obviously new researchers would do uh, genetic algorithms, not local search. For the time being, I see there is still a lot of, uh, a lot of competition. So I, don't, I cannot say that something is better than something else. My, my job, the way I do it, is I use my weapon as as, as, uh, as as better as possible, and to compete with the others. So obviously, um, as I said, so the best one emerges over time. If you ask me now, if I have a, a student uh, not working with me, what I suggest, uh, I uh, I say. I have no strong opinion whether population based or local search. I think they are both uh, reasonable uh, tools to try, including. So, every at this stage, I would say there is no winner, no clear winner. So, uh, I stick to my to my weapon, but I I advise you to stick to yours. And and the new students say stick to the weapon of your supervisor. So that's my answer. So thank use you. what the supervisor suggests you because the supervisor is going to help you on that. Yeah, thank, thank you. So in your case, you do population based. So let your student do what you do. Yeah. No, I'm moving. I'm moving from the local search to the population based. Okay. Already, so. So, right. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. You're welcome. I'm so uh, because uh, people are now leaving let me make some announcements first and then after that if there are more questions we can let the questions because uh, uh, there are only 31 30 people in here uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, we are now getting into the vacation month so for the next six weeks we don't have anything scheduled uh, we got from the program committee a bunch of suggestions made for speakers for next year and we think that we are, and we will start scheduling. Uh, we have to, of course, approach some of the speakers soon. We think that we will start the second week of September. The second week of September, and then we do the usual schedule of every other week. And again, we try, like we did this year, we try to keep some diversity. And by the way, the diversity uh, we are thinking about is uh, gender diversity, uh, geographic diversity, and also topic diversity. So you can imagine that this is a little bit harder than just a strongly NP-hard problem. Those strongly NP-hard combinatorial problems are very easy in comparison with this one. So um, we are, uh, we hope to have, because we, of course, we have to invite those speakers and it has to have to fit in their schedules and we have 20 names of people that we would like, that we would think that will have, uh, be, will be able to present very, very nice uh, talks for which there will be a substantial interest. 
So those people are going to be approached within the next two, three weeks. Uh, so this is a little bit with regard to the schedule of next year. We will start up again uh, by the second week of September. So people can go in Europe. They tend to go on vacation in August. And the vacation, as you know, it's quite holy. Uh, so we, we better not uh, schedule anything in, uh, from now till the beginning of September. Okay, if you have any questions, either to me with regard to the schedule of next year, or uh, with regard to Andrea's talk, well, you can you can continue asking questions. Okay, thank you. I think there is a question from uh, from the chat. So, um, how do you handle ch last time changes? Uh, do you rerun the software penalize changes, or do you do it by hand? Uh, uh, at the time, I did it by hand or by control at hand. So. Change the constraints. Uh, please do me the best move. So really, I would say by hand, by hand with a little bit of help from the solver. But uh, if I would do it today, I would try to do it with uh, penalizing with uh, minimal perturbation penalization, things like that. Because uh, at that time was really, really a lot of time consuming activity. So if I have a chance to rewrite the code, I would do with a uh, penalization for uh, some sort of, uh, so I, I would rewrite the code with this idea of uh, penalizing the changes. At that time, I didn't do it. There is a question from Nico Schmidt about the newsletter for upcoming webinars. I suppose that's, that's a general you. question, general question about any type of webinar. Um, I don't know about any newsletter. Uh, I know about this particular seminar series that the moment we know something that we have a speaker lined up, it will be on the website. That's the, and then hopefully we have also the abstract also on the website, but of course we depend on the speakers. But yeah, uh, it, your, the general aspect of your question, I don't know any news, any newsletter that uh, if there is one, that would be nice. Maybe somebody in the audience knows about something. Yeah, as, uh, as uh, Willem wrote in the chat, uh, there will be the schedule on the, on the website, plus there is the mailing list where you can register and you will be continuously informed about upcoming, upcoming seminars. Okay, so we can go on with questions. Okay, very good. So I suppose if there are no other other questions, so maybe maybe I can ask you if we, if you like our seminars, please please uh, like our videos on YouTube. Please share them. It will uh, increase the visibility of this seminar, which we believe is very important for scheduling community. Um, and that's it. Uh, Michael, do you have anything else to say? No, no, I don't have. Uh, okay, I hope all of you have a nice vacation and I hope to see all of you back uh, may, in the beginning of that, September. May I say that uh, obviously if somebody is looking at this uh, uh, seminar uh, uh, offline, they can contact me by email. Uh, we will be happy to answer any email. So the email was in the first line of the of the talk. So thank you for, uh, for attending. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Have thank a great, you. great holiday and uh, see you, see you soon. Okay. Bye -bye. See you soon. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.